of, I think what we're seeing is primarily ions from the region above the permanently shattered region where the L-cross impactor hit. So my background is uh, spectroscopy. I've been um, in infrared spectroscopist for a couple decades, and now I'm becoming a UV spectroscopist. And so I'd like to thank the early tutoring um, by Rosemary Killen and recently by Kurt Rutherford. Um, so the, what I'm going to be telling you is that the lines that have been predicted for the lunar exosphere include magnesium-1, calcium-1, iron-1, aluminum-1, and sodium-1. And um, mag uh, magnesium was observed, as I'm going to be reporting, calcium-2 is stronger than calcium-1. There's iron-1 lines, titanium-1 lines, and by grooming through the spectrum some more, I think I'm seeing aluminum-1 and possibly uh, oxygen also. The spectrum are complex, as I will indicate. So the L-cross, just to remind you, the L-cross Centaur uh, was a two-spacecraft two mission, basically an empty rocket junk, 2,000-kilogram impactor hit into this uh, permanently shadowed region, and we followed it in by four minutes by a, a suite of nine instruments on what we call the shepherding spacecraft. This is a, a diviner image of the region, just to emphasize again the very high mountain peaks that surround Cabeus Crater, um, and that this particular viewing geometry you had was that the sunlight was streaming in from this direction. This again is a thermal image, but it uh, represents very well the date of the impact. And the sunlight is streaming in from this side, so the sunlight horizon is about 0.8 kilometers above the surface. What I'll be showing you is that as our field of view decreased from uh, initially when we were at an altitude of 8,000 kilometers and we uh, basically zoomed in on where we're going to impact, we had about an hour's worth of observations before the impact. And uh, by an analyzing these observations, we can see that there's an emergent emission line spectrum and when our field of view tucks into the permanently shadowed region and uh, sunlight from the surrounding area is uh, no longer uh, dominating the spectrum, the emission line spectrum is very obvious. So I'm going to talk to you about three different regions of the Elf Cross event. First, the plume, which you've heard about, to give you a reference frame for what you've already learned about. Then I'll back up and talk about this region between 940 and 625 kilometers where we're, our field of view is in the persistently shadowed region, very minimal sunlight, and basically over this time frame of 125 seconds, there's no evolution in the line strengths. This serves as a very good fiducial for what we're seeing. And then a brief description of the high altitude descent. So uh, in Tony Colapreet's talk and in other talks given previously on L-Cross, we've talked about that within the first few seconds after impact, we saw a thermal crater and a strong rise in a uh, basically the scattered light continuum and emission lines. And we also saw um, Rosemary Killen saw sodium at high altitudes. And in our shepherding spacecraft down viewing, nadir view, we saw a slightly delayed release of sodium and then a decay. If you actually look at how this appears uh, in the light curve, that basically we're on this descent path, the descent path basically takes us kind of like this in radiance, and we see a very strong peak of scattered light from a low angle plume that lasts about 50 seconds, and then this sustained uh, scattered light from what we call hang high angle plume, or basically material that kind of went straight up and straight down, almost like a pencil, very narrow column. So uh, again, the, the emphasis here is to talk about what happens to this First, what you've heard about before, the sodium. So I've color-coded the light curve so that it basically inverts at red, so that you, the, basically the low angle plume goes away at about red. And what you're seeing here is uh, the initial black line is pre-impact. Basically, the scatter light goes up, and with it, the sodium one line. And then uh, before the complete disappearance of that low angle plume, the sodium's already fading. So basically, there was an impact sustained rapid release of sodium that dissipated, went to high altitudes so that it could be seen uh, from the ground also. And um, secondly, let's look towards the ultraviolet um, at the magnesium-1 line, uh, 285 nanometer line. This line is basically seen before impact and it is the same radiance 
all the way through impact until the last 30 kilometers. So basically, it's almost we're looking at continuous uh, density sources. We're coming in closer. Uh, we're, in, we're improving our flux by decrease in distance by r squared, but our surface area that we're looking at, our volumetric areas, is decreasing. So basically, we get about a constant flux until we get close to the surface. Now, if you look at calcium-2, this is the uh, doublet in the solar, solar spectrum. Basically, it's very easy to see. This is uh, an anomalous cosmic ray, but basically, if you look at just the evolution of the spectrum, starting with the black line, and you follow it toward, to the ground, you basically see the uh, calcium-2 line come up. And it is in the same ratio of about 4 to 1 as it's seen in Mercury spectrum. So when we get to about 50 kilometers in altitude above the surface, we see the calcium line strongly. So we have three different emission line behaviors post-impact in the plume. We have this prompt release and dissipation of the sodium-1 line that's we think is basically impact generated. We have a magnesium one line, which is sustained all the way through the plume, doesn't really be affected by the, by the impact at all, the centaur. And then we have a calcium one line, which if you do the subtraction of the solar spectrum is there, but does increase in strength as you get towards the surface. So now let's back up and look at what happens in the first um, hour before impact. And we basically can do something very simple. We can take the line center of the solar spectrum and measure the line, the line height. And basically, the magnesium one line slowly grows in height as the amount of, uh, as you're getting close to the surface. And then about 3,100 kilometers, you get a significant increase, levels off. And then as we tuck into the permanently shuttered region, the line flux goes, the line radiance goes up. And then I'm zooming in on uh, the calcium. The sodium line is basically unchanged through the whole pre-impact descent. The calcium line, both lines basically grow in strength slowly, but significantly when you tuck your field of view into the permanently shadow region. And here's a zoom in of the calcium lines and showing how I'm measuring their effective strength compared to the solar spectrum. So I'm just going to uh, crudely kind of just draw a line through this. Um, and show that to you on a cartoon. Um, so basically, the idea is that the field of view is decreasing to the point where we're, oops, excuse me, um, centered in on the permanently shadow region. And at that, when our field of view tucks to the point where, in the, where we're in Cabeus Crater, the magnesium one line increases. And when our field of view tucks into the permanently shadow region, we get a significant increase in radiance. And as we get to within 50 kilometers of the surface, we get a significant increase in calcium. So this is just what uh, Manuel Sarantos was talking about, is that the calcium should be uh, thermally released somehow um, and be lower in altitude. But the interesting thing is that this is inside a doubly shadowed region, permanently shadowed region. And here's just, a, an, again, our field of view when we drop into this region. Basically, it's between here and here where we're basically not seeing any directly lit terrain. So if we, if we look at just that part, just to convince you even more, here is the emission line spectrum in purple. And the scaled solar spectrum is beneath it. And if I subtract it, I get the spectrum in black. And the tiny little blue uh, hashes are the uncert propagated uncertainties. And so we basically have a lot of lines that vary between 200 in signal to noise to 40 or down to 20. So I'm identifying here clearly the magnesium one line, the iron one line that was predicted by Potter and Killen, and uh, the calcium two specifically. The, this is the stronger line. And um, there's a couple mo other lines that are probably iron lines. Uh, from the lower level transitions, close to the ground state. There's four lines in getting close to the blue end of the spectrum that are titanium one. And um, we, I think I see aluminum, possibly oxygen. And that basically the UV emission line spectrum is very complex. And the magnesium lines are not only from the ground state to the first excited state, 
but uh, there appears to be some resonant pumping from that state upward and down. So that, for instance, uh, if I was looking at perhaps somehow an excitation to an intermediate state and looking at those transitions from a non-radiatively pumped state, those lines are very weak in comparison. So it does look like a radiatively pumped spectrum. So how could these, how could we have a concentration of ions and neutrals? That's in particular, we're seeing the calcium plus, and um, I think we're seeing aluminum plus stronger than aluminum over the permanently shadow region. Well, it was very timely that Bill Farrell gave a talk at the wet versus dry moon workshop just a month ago, and he showed this slide. So I'll do my best to describe it. But basically, he's looking at the, uh, the ambipolar diffusion of electrons and ions uh, into a permanently shadow region over a mountain. So basically, um, the, the ions are moving much slower than the electrons. Electrons have thermal speeds, and so the electrons can penetrate more easily to the surface. And in doing so, they produce a, an electric uh, charge on the surface, a negative charge. Um, if there's just a negative charge on the surface, the negative charge, as he describes it, just pulls the positive, electro positive ions out of, out of the stream. And, it increases the sputtering. And so he also computed what happens if there's secondary electrons that that weakens, secondary electrons then weaken the effective uh, negative potential, but still get some in significantly enhanced deflection of ions um, that is solar wind protons into uh, the permanently shadowed region. So I think this is really neat. It's, the spectrum is very complex. Um, here is just, a, again, a, a, the published uh, abstract uh, figure showing that as you descend in altitude, the magnesium one line becomes very apparent with contrast to the solar spectrum compared to the prediction of Sarantos et al. 2011 LPS uh, for seeing this line from Laddie. Um, the spectrum is very complex. Again, um, in the impact, through the impact plume, the magnesium one line is sustained. The calcium two line gets stronger at less than 50 kilometers. Um, in this ideal time where we basically have no direct sunlight into the spectrometer, uh, we have this uh, 19 scans that are, produce a high signal noise spectrum. I'm calling this Cabe the Cabeus PSR spectrum. And at high altitude, we have this interesting descent uh, trajectory. So we hope to be able to un understand if there is any uh, additional height information we can gain from that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Do we have any questions? Melios, here in the Yeah, the real issue is what intensities these numbers correspond to. Because I used that same data set a year ago when, when it was released to the PDS. And I gave up because the numbers were nonsensical. I mean, I was seeing the magnesium line at one kilo Rayleigh. So could you convert that to, uh, to Rayleigh and, and, and make sure that it makes sense? I mean, that, that's my only comment. I do agree. I mean, these are detections, uh, but, uh, but uh, we found out that there were a lot of dark counts. I hope that you guys um, remove dark counts uh, better than, than in the initial version of the PDS. And, uh, and the number, just it was a, a kilo Rayleigh of magnesium, and we gave up on it because that's wrong. Short word of 380 nanometers, the radiance calibration is not good. And I, so we are working and that, that. And yeah, and that's why we gave up on it. But, but, but the Rayleigh's is, is really what matters. Um, well, Rayleigh's the, the, and watts per meter square per micron. Right, the, right. The but, same, you basically but as you knowledge. saw, I mean, what we expect is about 50 Rayleigh's or 100 Rayleigh's, and this was a short line of sight, you know, 3,000 uh, 3, kilometers, as you said, and it just didn't make sense to us. I, I looked at this data with Rosemary, and it was just too much magnesium. So, yeah, it's very interesting. These are detections, uh, if, if they make sense. Well, they are detections we need to figure out. First off, I do agree that between 250 and 380 nanometers, the radiance calibration is um, from the ground, not from space. And I'm working with the, basically the scattering law at the angle that we have made the observations in order to try to take the very high altitude and do the radiance calibration short work up there, which definitely is my next step. That's why I haven't 
showing you any numbers. But the, these 19 spectra that produce uh, high signal to noise line detections are unquestionable. So yes, it is the next step to get the radiance calibration right and then to figure out what the number densities are. And if they were as weak as, you, as we think they would be, perhaps it would have been a lot harder to detect. So this is, um, these, the spectra that I have, I have uh, like 600 spectra of high enough signal to noise to do the analysis on the I know. Oh, so, I've seen them. The magnesium line didn't look wide enough uh, in the in the data I was working with. Maybe you have higher data.